Alrighty guys, welcome back to the shop. Today we're going to be making a knife that can secretly hold a cryptocurrency hardware wallet. There are many detailed videos on YouTube explaining how to self-custody your Bitcoin private keys offline on a hardware wallet. However, that is not the goal of this video. But for the sake of understanding what we're doing here today, I'll provide some cliff notes. A hardware wallet securely holds a user's private keys, which are required for him or her to access his or her Bitcoin on the blockchain. Without these private keys, the Bitcoin is essentially lost to the user. A hardware wallet is often referred to as cold storage, since the user's private keys are taken offline and away from an exchange like Coinbase or Kraken. Thus, using a hardware wallet is in general considered more secure. Lastly, a user could, in theory, convert all of his or her assets to Bitcoin and secure the private keys on a hardware wallet. These funds could be accessed with the hardware wallet itself or with a recovery seed phrase if something were to happen to the hardware wallet. This makes it possible for someone to carry all of his or her net worth in the knife we're building today. So hypothetically, this can be the most valuable knife ever made. I'm going to be making this knife out of AEBL stainless steel, which is around an eighth of an inch thick. After achieving the general profile, the next step will be to mill a pocket for the hardware wallet. In this case, we're going to be using a hardware wallet made by the company Ledger, since it has a small form factor. To mill this pocket, I'm using an eighth of an inch carbide end mill and the hand dials in my mini mill. The eighth of an inch radius in the corner was actually too large to fit the ledger wallet, so you'll see me reduce this radius later in the build. You can see that I had the knife clamped to my table on top of some one, two, three blocks. However, I think if I were to do this project again, I would mill the pocket before profiling the blade since it would make it easier to clamp. I'd like to note here that I'll be putting a set of PDF plans for this knife up on my Patreon for my extremely awesome and loyal patrons. So check that out if you want to make one of these knives. I also plan on auctioning this specific knife and will pin the first comment with the auction link. Before getting this knife heat treated, I made sure to clean up the rough finish left behind by the end mill. It's also imperative to drill out our holes while the steel is still soft. I'm going to be using some Torx head Gulso fasteners I found at Maker's Material Supply. I'll make sure to put a link in the description with these fasteners along with some other items and tools I used during the build. After drilling these number 23 holes, we'll file in our spine jimping with a checkering file and our sharpening choil with a chainsaw file. Like the holes in the tang, this filing needs to be done before the heat treatment. Now I actually started this project a long time ago, so I will not be heat treating this knife with my DIY heat treating oven that we recently built on the channel. Since it's a stainless steel blade, heat treating it in the forge is not feasible. For this reason, I sent it off for professional heat treatment by Jared Todd. He does excellent work and I highly recommend him for those of you looking to get into knife making but who are intimidated by the heat treating process. I requested Jared heat treat this blade to a 61 Rockwell hardness which he verified with his hardness tester. Since Jared uses stainless steel foil to wrap the blade during heat treatment, there is very little scale to contend with. My first goal after heat treatment is to get the knife cleaned up by grinding the profile to a 320 grit finish and using my homemade surface grinder to clean up the flats to the same grit. I find that this is a good starting point for grinding out our bevels. While we're on the surface grinder, I'll mention a few things. Firstly, I like to use a structured abrasive belt like a Trizac belt when surface grinding. These belts seem to be more uniform in thickness and the severity of the dreaded belt bump caused by the seam is way less pronounced than on a normal aluminum oxide J-Flex belt. Secondly, for the best surface finish and overall levels of flatness, I like to make small advancements towards the wheel coupled with a high number of passes for each advance. I'm only moving the table around one to three thousandths of an inch per advancement, and I make around 20 plus passes. As y'all can see in these clips, we have moved this project to the new shop. The first step in the grinding process will be to make our edge center line. By grinding to the center line first with an aggressive angled bevel, we establish a solid and straight base for our grinding. I'm using my work rest on the Northridge grinder to carefully grind to the center line, leaving an edge thickness of around ten thousandths of an inch. In order to reduce the chances of overheating my blade post heat treatment, I'll be incorporating this misting system from Brian House that I recently reviewed. If you'd like to see that review, check out the cards attached to this video. I found that the misting system did a great job in keeping my blade cool and sped up the grinding process for this knife. It allowed me to spend more time grinding the blade and less time dipping the blade in water. For this knife, my belt progression started with a 60 grit ceramic belt followed by 120 and 220 J-Flex belts. Lastly, I hit the knife briefly on a Scotch-Brite belt just because I like the finish that it leaves. As I mentioned earlier, we need to enlarge the corner radius of our milled window in order for our Ledger hardware wallet to fit. 
To accomplish this task, I used a diamond impregnated burr on my die grinder. You can see here that I have a nice and snug fit with the hardware wallet and the tang and a knife. It's worth mentioning that if you want to maximize the amount of steel around the hardware wallet, you could remove the silver hinge shroud on the wallet and mill a smaller pocket. I then hand sanded the blade up to a uniform 320 grit finish with Rhino Wet sandpaper. I started off with a hard backer to ensure that I sanded out any peaks and valleys on the blade. I'm thinking about getting a disc sander for this purpose after watching Aaron Lee's video on his disc grinder setup, which by the way is worth checking out if you haven't seen it yet. I've also seen disc grinder endorsements from legendary knife makers like Nick Wheeler, who routinely uses a disc grinder to finish his bevels. Once the hand sanding is complete, it's time to etch in our maker's mark with my DIY electrochemical etching machine. I hit the stencil 15 times for one second on DC power for a nice and deep etch, then around five times for one second on AC power in order to darken our etch. I then lightly sand over the mark in order to clean up its edges. Now that we have the blade completed, We'll move on to our handle. We'll be constructing this handle out of some olive G10 along with some orange and black G10 liners. Before gluing the handle scales to the liners, it's good practice to make sure the surfaces are sanded flat and clean. This knife is the first full tang takedown handle that I've constructed, meaning simply that the handle scales will be removable. Like mentioned earlier in the build, this is made possible by using the Galso fasteners from Maker Material Supply. I must say that I really enjoy building a full tang knife with the removable handle scales since it allows you as the maker to work on components individually. I think this point will become more apparent with the handle construction footage. I clamped the scales to the blade so that I can use the existing number 23 holes in the tang as a drill guide. Once the holes are drilled, I can insert the female end of the gull cell fasteners into the scales in order to index each scale to the tang. This makes it possible to mark out the profile of the mill tang into each of the scales. I will be using an eighth of an inch end mill to mill out a 123 thousandths of an inch pocket into each scale. When milling the holes, I use the hand dials on my mill to remove the material up to my scribed lines. I also slightly overshot the corners so that the hardware wallet, which has more square corners, could fit into the pockets. This operation could be completed more precisely on a CNC machine or by using a digital readout. However, this method was more than adequate for our project. Overall, this process was very painless with my mini mill and the carbide end mill ate up the G10 without issues. To finish out the milling and drilling operation on these scales, we need to counterbore our number 23 holes to accept the quarter inch OD fasteners. Using the counterbore from McMaster, I counterbored these holes so that the fasteners would be recessed from the outside of the scales by around 30 thousandths of an inch. This dimension will be reduced some during the handle shaping on the grinder later in the build. Now that the holes are drilled and the pockets are milled, we can roughly profile the handle scales to our scribed lines. Once I have both of the scales roughed in, the advantages of removable handle scale construction begins to become more apparent. I'm able to attach the scales to each other and uniformly grind the front of the scales to match. I then attach the handle scales to the blade and use my grinder in the horizontal orientation to grind the profile of the handle scales down to the metal tang of the knife. I like doing this operation on the horizontal platen so that I can get a nice 320 grit belt finish along the spine of the knife and I have a nice starting point for sculpting with the scales and spine being squared to each other. I'll comment here that the Lockline Dust Collection Arm Attachment for my shop back has been performing well and is pretty convenient to use when swapping between vertical and horizontal grinding. So thanks again to Jeremy at Simple Little Life for showing us all this kit. After getting the scales flush with the tang, I can then once again remove the scales from the knife, attach them to each other, and do my handle sculpting without the blade in the way. The ability to add and remove the blade from the handle scales at will is really nice to say the least. An additional benefit is that if at any point during the handle shaping process you happen to scratch the blade, you can always go back to the hand sanding bench with the scales off and fix the problem. This would be an excellent handle construction for a Damascus blade since you can protect the edge on the spine of the knife. Now y'all just saw me grinding the bevels on the front of my handle scales. Normally I'd grind in a larger bevel on the front of the handle scales, however, in this case, the fastener location towards the front of the handle would be encroached upon if the bevel was larger. With the blade removed, I was able to do the bulk of my handle shaping on a two inch contact wheel with a 60 grit belt. I finished up the handle grinding by using the slack belt portion of my grinder and a 320 grit J-Flex belt. This gives me a solid starting point for hand sanding and I proceeded to hand sand the handle up to a 1000 grit finish. To sharpen the blade, I'm using the sharpening system kit from Brian at Housework, 
which I mentioned earlier in the video when grinding my bevels. In a nutshell, this system allows the user to sharpen his or her blade on the belt grinder without risk of overheating the edge. I started with a 600 grit Norax belt, moved to a 1200 grit Norax belt, and finally stropped with a 600 grit cork belt loaded with green buffing compound. This produced a nice sharp working edge for the knife that easily cuts through paper and shaves hair. The primary purpose of this knife is to conceal a ledger hardware wallet which results in a fairly weak tang, so I would advise not using this knife for heavy work. However, it will perform just fine for normal cutting tasks. Since this knife will be concealing a hardware wallet, I can assume the user may want to transport it, so to do so conveniently, any good knife needs a sheath. I thought about making a Kydex sheath for this knife, however, after taking a deep dive into leather work recently, I found that I prefer the look and function of a leather sheath over Kydex. However, like most things, they both have their place. With the knife being the focal point of this video, I'll be speeding through the sheath making process. However, I have a full and detailed leather pocket sheath tutorial that I'll place in the cards above. I also want to pay homage to Mr. Paul Long since his tutorials on leather sheaths have had a huge influence on my leather work, so make sure to buy his DVDs. I'll be making this sheath out of Wicked & Craig 8 ounce leather and cutting it out with my homemade head knife. I have found that spending time cutting out the template cleanly pays dividends in the sheath building process. I used to rush this, but now I really slow down to make sure I have a square and crisp cut. Once I have the template cut out, I true up the mouth of the sheath on the belt grinder and finish this edge by beveling it with a number two edge beveler, sanding it up to a 320 grit paper, burnishing it with a cheap power burnisher, and dyeing it to match the sheath. These operations are nearly impossible once the sheath is put together. I then case the leather to make it soft using a water and procarb solution. With the leather softened up, I pressed in my maker's mark with an arbor press and a 3D printed stamp from Ghost Graphics. I really like how this stamp has been performing and would highly recommend them for anyone making custom leather products. We'll then fold over the belt loop and glue it to the back of the sheath with contact cement. Using a washer, I'll mark out my stitch line. I'll use some cheap pricking irons to space out my holes. I'll drill out my holes with a needle and a drill press and then using a locking saddle stitch and wax thread, I'll secure the belt loop on the back of the sheath. I've recently gotten a few questions on my stitching pony and where I purchased it. I can tell you that it was literally the cheapest one I found on Amazon, and with a small hinge modification, it's been doing an awesome job at holding my sheaths while I saddle stitch. This contraption is a huge improvement from trying to use a bench vise or no vise at all. When gluing up the sheath, I take great care in lining up all of the edges, and then head over to the belt sander to level these edges. I then use a stitch groover to groove in my stitch line so that my stitches will be recessed into the sheath. The next steps are the same ones I use with the belt loop. I use my cheap pricking irons to mark off my hole spacing. I use a needle and a drill press to press through the three layers of leather. And then I stitch the sheath with wax thread and a saddle stitch. I have found that a good rule of thumb for cutting your thread is multiplying the distance you plan on saddle stitching by 10 and then using that length of thread for your project. I'm also using some high quality John Jones saddler's needles, and these have been performing extremely well for me. Once the sheath has been stitched, the next step is to oil the sheath with neat's foot oil and flash dry it with a heat gun. I then divert my attention to the edge of the sheath. I hand sand this edge with a 320 grit sandpaper and a product called Quick Slick. However, saddle soap would also work well during these steps as an alternative. We then dye the edge and apply back coat to the sheath as a final protective finish. All right, so this is the moment we've all been waiting for. We're gonna put this thing together. To do so, I'll start off by inserting the female Gulso fasteners into the right scale so I can use them to line up the knife onto the scale. I then place the Ledger hardware wallet into the center of the tank pocket. You can see that this is a fairly tight fit and the device won't move very much once inserted. Then using the female fasteners as a guide, I place the knife onto the right handle scale. At this point, I line up the other scale's pocket with the hardware wallet and install the male Gulso fasteners. I then snug them up pretty good and the knife is officially assembled. Depending on how often you plan on accessing your hardware wallet, you can use Loctite on these threads in order to reduce the chances of them ever coming loose. Now I have to say I think this knife is one of the coolest knives I've ever made, likely because it's truly one of a kind. The owner of this knife can theoretically hold the keys to his or her total net worth in the handle of this knife, thus making it potentially the most valuable knife ever made. Now I can see some may say that this knife would be a prime target for a thief, which is true. However, this thief would likely not know what is housed in the handle. This would give the owner ample time to recover his or her seed phrase and use it to transfer the funds to a new wallet. 
Not to mention if the thief did find the hardware wallet in the handle, they still have to break the numeric pin and unique passphrase if enabled. Like always, I really hope you all enjoyed this build. I'm going to be auctioning this knife on eBay during the days following this video's release, so if you want to get your hands on it, that's your chance. I'll put a link to this auction in the first comment down below. I'm also uploading the PDF plans for the profile of this knife and the sheath template on my Patreon for my patrons. In addition, I'm toying around with using the dimension plans for this knife to create an NFT, which if I do, I'll be placing in the first comment as well. If y'all did like this video, please click the like button and consider subscribing to the channel for more interesting knife builds in the future. With that, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.